Okay. Welcome to Homeschool Conversations with Humility and Doxology, a series of interviews with real life homeschool moms and dads and other educators. I'm Amy Sloan, a second generation homeschool mom of five, and I'm so glad that you have joined us. Be sure to check out the show notes for this conversation at humilityanddoxology.com. Today, I'm joined by Kate Snow. Kate, thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, it's great to be here, Amy. Thanks so much for having me. Well, Kate is on a mission to help parents teach math with confidence. She graduated from Harvard with both a math degree and an elementary teaching certificate. With experience as a classroom teacher, math curriculum writer, homeschool mom, and math tutor, she's taught math from preschool to high school. And that's basically where my kids are right now. So this is <laughs> the whole range. <laughs> exactly. And now she writes math curriculum for the Well-Trained Mind Press. She tutors homeschoolers and provides support and resources for parents as they teach math. And whenever I am asked like a math question, I'm always like, well, I may not know the answer, but let me tell you where you should go. <laughs> well, thank you for sending people my way. It's always a joy to me when I can help people feel a little bit more confident teaching math. Well, Kate, could you tell us a little bit about your family and just your own history with math and math education? Have you always loved numbers? Uh, so I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I have two kids. Elizabeth is nine, and Henry just turned 13, and he is 5'11", and it is freaking me out. Uh, <laughs> but they, and uh, my husband's in IT here at our hospital system. Um, and so I have, I have always loved numbers. I was totally one of those kids who just loved math all the way through um, and, you know, enjoyed my high school math courses and got to college. And... Um, and was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and figuring out if I wanted to major in math. And I hit a class that was so incredibly hard. It's called real analysis. And I just hit the wall. I've had years and years of success in my life in math and could not figure out this class. And I almost failed it. The pastor gave me a very generous C minus, I think, to let me pass without being on academic probation the next year. Um, and it was such a good experience for me to realize what it's like to struggle, to have that feeling of, you know, oh my goodness, like I can't do this. I have no idea what's going on and I feel just at sea. Um, and so I, and I'd been leaning towards math education, but it was a really pivotal experience for me to feel that in math and then to think about, well, how can I bring this into my own teaching as I graduate from college and move into my career? Um, so. I then became an elementary school teacher in Boston and loved teaching my fifth graders. It's like my favorite age. Um, Ten-year-olds are just so much fun. Um, and then once uh, my husband and I met and we moved to Grand Rapids, um, I started homeschooling my kids. And I discovered um, as I, you know, went to co-ops and play dates and park dates and such, I realized how much so many moms were struggling with math. Um, I kind of became like the math mom in my circle, you know, the, like, I love it. Like, wait, when you've got a question, go talk to Kate. Um, and as my kids got a little older, I wanted something that it was a little bit more for myself, as you know all about, kind of the, wanted to have a project on the side and something else. Um, and so that's how I started my website. Um, and so I homeschooled my kids for several years. They're currently, at, well, they were at a classical school for this year and now we're home again. I'm really enjoying homeschooling them again. Um, and along the way, I've written some books and uh, then done the book. tutoring has also been a real joy for me to really experience the whole, whole gamut of ages and the whole gamut of skills um, that I tutor kids of a big range of abilities. And that's been great. It's been a, another great learning experience for me to see um, all the different ways that kids approach math. Uh, so that's kind of who I am and where I come from with math. Well, I love what you were saying about how you realized with like in homeschool co-ops and things, there were a lot of moms who were struggling with math. And I think that that's something that is a subject that can sometimes bring a little bit of fear or unknown, like I'm not sure how to teach my kids. I don't want them to have the same struggles I did. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, so I was homeschooled and I was very blessed to have a mom who was enthusiastic about all subjects, mm -hmm. not, not, you know, discluded Wonderful. from that. Yes. <laughs> and so, and we were always like, if we had a question, 
we would always figure out like, okay, well, we don't know, but let's figure it out. So it was like a problem to be solved mm -hmm. or a puzzle. Mm -hmm. And, but I'm realizing more and more just how that's, that's not the same way that a lot of people have to approach it. And it can just be so scary. So I know that this is going to be an encouragement to, to mom. So the question I kind of have is, to start is how can we set our kids up for success with math and that's going to change i know you're going to do something different with your preschooler than your <laughs> high schooler so if you could kind of give like big picture for us here what are some practical things we can do sort of at each stage along the way to help our kids really be successful with math sure well i just love foundation for success is having the attitude that math makes sense and that we can figure this out together. Like you don't have to be the expert for your child. You know, it's okay to be a co-explorer, you know, kind of blazing the trail together. You've got the machete out and you're hacking through the weeds. Um, but to start from the premise that math does make sense. There is a reason for this. You know, all of these processes that we, a lot of us were just taught to memorize, like long division, or you and I have talked about dividing fractions before. You know, all those processes, they have a reason for them and there's a logic to them and that can be figured out. And I think when people start with that as their underlying assumption, it changes the entire endeavor. You know, as opposed to just like, okay, we just have to memorize this and get through this unit and get to the next one. Um, it makes it much more into a sense making process and it and that's also um, it allows us opposed to like I'm just assigning you all these problems to do you will memorize that um, and so it's a great way to get as your underlying premise and also um, if you have math anxiety yourself it helps you take that down a notch because you don't have to be the expert um, and I know a lot of moms have math anxiety from the way that they were taught, from their feelings, like I felt in that college class of just feeling at sea. Um, but to try to not pass that along to your child, just zip your lip on that. <laughs> and, yes. uh, you know, we all have things we fake as mothers, and that's one that fake it till you make it, um, because that can be that can be really undermining when children absorb that. So that's kind of like the big picture um, in terms of practical details um you're I, you're completely right there's these different stages and different things are important and i think sometimes it's easy to feel like every single thing in the math book is equally important um but realizing that it's not can take a lot of pressure off um and so like in preschool for example obviously counting is huge um, as well as subitizing which is recognizing small quantities by sight um, so doing things like holding up four fingers and being like, oh, how many are there? Can you tell without counting after a child has some experience with counting? Those are really foundational skills in the preschool years. Um, moving into elementary, um, obviously math facts are, I've written a whole series of books on math facts. They're very important to me, um, but they're important for a reason that they really are a core foundation. Um, in the elementary years, as much as you can focus on helping kids understand what those basic operations addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, mean, and then learning the basic facts and mental math skills with those, that's really core for moving on to the next stage. And you'll notice I didn't actually say the written calculations. They're important for kids to learn, um, but I actually think those math facts and mental math skills are more important often in building a deep foundation of number sense. Um, the other things kind of come more easily once you have that solid base with the easier numbers. Um, let's see, the middle school, fractions, decimals, percents, that's what it's all about, <laughs> proportional thinking. So to focus on that. And then, you know, in, once kids get into high school, they're kind of taking different paths in their math um, courses, right? Some are college prep, kind of going through like algebra two and pre-calculus. Um, some are going in a more like practical application kind of math. Um, but the thing that really helps kids succeed when it comes to high school math is learning how to be independent learners in math. Um, and so you've probably found that with your own high schooler. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, look, teaching kids that they need to slow down when they read math and read it like, uh, you know, like directions for putting together an Ikea dresser rather than like reading a novel. Um, learning to be neat and to organize their work. This is one to I will show say. their work, to show, show their, their work. work. Oh, the times uh, I say this, I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> my algebra tutoring students, you know, 
see, if you just had shown that step, then you wouldn't have made that mistake. Right. And oh. This is a battle I'm still fighting with my tutoring students and with my own son. So I, I, there's no magic solution to that. But the more <laughs> you can encourage it, the better off everyone will be. Um, and I think just in helping children throughout understand that it's okay if math is hard. <laughs> that when things are hard, it doesn't mean you're bad at them. It means just that you're thinking hard, you're doing hard work. And math is a subject where there's gonna be some hard work to do and that's okay. Nothing's wrong with you because it's hard. Yeah, that is so important. My oldest son has been working on pre-calculus and we're about finished with it. And that is, <laughs> yeah, so, and so that's like as far as I ever learned. And so we're reaching like the edges where, okay, I did fine in that myself, but it's definitely past my ability to be able to just sit there and be like, oh yes, I can explain this to you very easily. Oh, completely. So I was doing Algebra of, 2 this year and I had that same thing towards the end of Algebra 2, like, ooh, I have not thought about this in a long time. Exactly. <laughs> just forget some of the details. So it's been a really good opportunity when, you know, there's a question to, okay, well, let's go work backwards. Even that is a skill. Like, let's look at the solution and kind of work through this, figure out why mm -hmm. they did each step. And then once we've kind of worked through it that way, now you try this other problem on your own and see if that helped. Because that's also an important skill. Like if, they're, if they go to college and are in a class and they're, they're lost and they have an answer, like have to work backwards. And That's a really core one for understanding the kind of step-by-step -step processes and yeah, those big ideas in, in those upper level math classes. Yeah, but I'm definitely gonna need somebody to do next year because I'm, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Time to outsource. That is just fine. Yes. <laughs> I know I was at the end of Algebra 2, honestly, even with my math degree, I'm like, oh, I could do pre-calculus, pre but it would take me a lot of time to recapture all of this material that has vanished from my mind. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have a new uh, kindergarten math curriculum that's going to be releasing this spring, and I'm looking forward to that with my little kindergartner next year. I can't believe my baby is going to oh, be in kindergarten. That's a big milestone. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about what makes um, it distinctive and what your plans are for the rest of this curriculum project? Sure. Yes. So it's called Kindergarten Math with Confidence. And um, right now we are planning to continue it at least through fourth grade. So it is the beginning of an element, full elementary math curriculum um, with a teacher's guide and full color student workbook for every level. Um, so kindergarten will release this year, um, first grade will release next year, and then so on for the four years. First grade is um, just about done. The pilot testers are just used, going through the last few units. So. That's just, you know, it takes a long time to make books. That was something I never realized until I started writing books was like what, how long the lead time is uh, between writing and publishing. So first grade's almost done. Second grade is in the idea stage. Uh, so, uh, so they're on their way. Um, and so what, what I've really tried to do in these books is to give rigorous, thorough treatment of everything that kids need to know in each grade level, but also to make it fun and interactive and playful. Um, so that's been kind of my guiding principle. Really good math, really fun, enjoyable, uh, interactive for the families. Um, and so there's lots of things like really, like in the kindergarten level especially, of course, I wanted to make that very developmentally appropriate for kindergartners. So they're short lessons, like no more than 15 minutes, um, relay races, pretend store, um, you know, playing restaurant together. So lots of kind of real life activities that really engage kindergartners. Um, then there's also weekly enrichment and picture books. And um, so families have the option to do that. You know, you with your range of ages, you might not get to every enrichment activity and that's yeah. okay, they're optional. <laughs> but I wanted to make all those kind of, like the fun, lovely parts of math easy to do for parents. Yeah. And also feel like they're really giving their kids a solid foundation in math. Uh, I so, love yeah. that. So I'm really excited to have it coming out. I actually started this book maybe five years ago before I started the Math Facts That Stick books. And then we wow. put it on the side to do Math Facts That Stick. So having kindergarten be done and like at the printer right now, it just oh, yeah. it makes me so happy. <laughs> like see the illustrator has also done such a beautiful job. They're just like really sweet, whimsical little illustrations and oh. so colorful and yeah, 
it makes my heart very happy to see it finished. That is so exciting. I can't wait to see it. Well, well, I've got you on the list. You're the coming, coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, so you mentioned your math facts that stick books, which we have used and I love the way that they are set up. And you talked a little earlier about how important math facts are to you. So I wanted to give you a chance to explain a little bit about why that is important. Because sometimes you hear people say, oh, those aren't really important anymore. Like, we all have a calculator in our pocket, mm -hmm. you know. Do we really need to worry about these math facts? So what is your rationale or why are they important? Well, so the there's a couple different main reasons. One of the big ones is working memory. You know, this that brain scientists have kind of discovered that we can only hold, well, we know this from experience, but we can only hold so many things in our head at a time, right? Um, and so every like little task we do uh, takes some of our working memory. So when I'm trying to chop an onion for dinner and help a dog, my daughter with a math problem and listen to the radio and like say hello to my husband as he comes home you know like it all falls apart it's too many things yes um, that's how you lose a finger that's exactly because that's where this goes um, and so with math you know when children are doing basic calculations it's no big deal if they have to do like count out eight plus seven but when all of a sudden they're doing a three digit times two digit multiplication problem in wh where they're then adding those last two numbers together, having to stop and figure out eight times seven or eight plus seven for each of the additions becomes, you know, it just takes you out of this process and you kind of lose the thread of what you're doing. Um, but even worse than that is that kids often then can't understand the new material because they're so busy figuring out these basic problems. Um, I see that especially in like fractions and algebra. You know, if you are adding 8x plus 7x and you're stopping to have to think about that 8 plus 7 is 15, you have really lost the point of this like linear equation and graphing it and finding the slope and such. Um, and so that's working memory I think is a big part of it that it makes kids feel more confident in math, right? They, like it's less tedious. Like who wants to be in ninth grade still counting out eight plus seven? <laughs> you know? um, and so it's a feeling of uh, accomplishment and confidence that helps. And then the last reason that I think people sometimes underestimate when they're thinking about that calculator in their pocket is they're um, assuming that all problems come in ways that are easily packaged, right? And where you can just whip out a calculator to solve it. Um, again, going to like that algebra example, um, you know, there's lots of places in algebra where you need to be able to identify the factors of a number, right? What you multiply together to get it, you need to be able to know all the options, you need to be able to evaluate them quickly. That's not something you can pop into a calculator. <laughs> it's a totally different kind of thinking or to recognize square numbers or there's a lot of things where you have to do math backwards as you get into the higher grades. Uh, it's not just straight up forwards. Um, and so knowing the math facts is just core for all of those things. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, maybe a homeschool mom who's feeling a little discouraged because either her kid hates math or she's feeling like they're behind. What kind of encouragement can you give to her? And then how is the best way for her to move forward from there? That's a question I hear a lot because it's it can be really overwhelming if you find yourself in fourth, fifth, sixth grade and have a child who just is way behind. Um, I think the first thing that I would say to any mom in that position is that you need to let go of any guilt. You know, we all have so much, or at least I, carry so much guilt around for so many things. Um, the guilt just weighs us down. It doesn't help us move forward. Um, and so to start with where you're at and to try to start with just a realistic look at what your child knows. You might be pleasantly surprised if you actually kind of make a list of, well, what can they do? Well, they probably know some things. Um, I would then say that it's totally possible to help a child get back on track. Um, I've had several tutoring students, again, starting with like fourth graders who couldn't add three plus four. Um, you know, like really seriously behind because their moms had just gotten like overwhelmed and weren't sure what to do. Um, and it's completely possible to help them get back on track by the time they're in high school when you're like kind of start in that middle school range because middle school curriculum have a ton of mush, you know, like it's kind of they're like this accordion where like, well, you could spend two years on this or three or, you know, um, you know, so there's a lot of time within the middle school, uh, typical middle school curriculum too. 
kind of make up some ground, especially if you're at that point. Um, and then to say that if you're trying to um, kind of make up some ground quickly, focus on the, the most important stuff, getting back to what we started with at the beginning. You know, if you have a middle schooler, let's get them up to speed on addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Start there, one core goal. Don't pull a second grade curriculum out and start teaching every single lesson. Uh, you know, condense, do what's most necessary, then move on to fractions and just focus on fractions, decimals, percents for a while. Um, so to really streamline what you're doing, be consistent, but don't beat yourself up either. <laughs> it is That's a, really helpful. very discouraging, yeah. Yeah. And I and do have, oh sorry go ahead no i was just gonna say that's so helpful to just simplify it down because i think sometimes when we're facing some sort of challenge or problem it just gets bigger and bigger in our head and we're mm -hmm. it just feels too big to conquer but to just bring it down start with the basic addition subtraction multiplication division like then move to the next thing mm -hmm. that makes it that makes it feel more doable it does as opposed to i have like six years of math we need to make up or something yeah exactly I've just recently started a like a weekly column called Ask Kate where I take a question I get over email and uh, respond to it that way. Um, and I actually just did one on how to fill in math gaps for any parent who's in that situation. So I'll give you the link for that. Maybe you can include it in the show notes if there's any parents watching who would like kind of more specific nitty gritty of how to get into that question because it's one I hear a lot. Definitely. Yeah, that would be great. I'd love to include that in the in great. the show notes here. Sounds great. All right, so we're almost to the end of the traditional school year, although this school year hasn't really been traditional <laughs> for any of us. The school year is. We don't know what we're doing right now. Um, Maybe it's over. Who knows? <laughs> but in general, you know, we're kind of to that, you know, we're kind of to that point in the year where we're looking at how many lessons are left in the math book and how many weeks are left in our school year. And so what is sort of, I know you have written about this before and we've talked about this before. How, how do we make decisions to, do we have to finish the whole textbook, every single lesson, every single problem? And if not, how do we decide what's most important? It's a great question. And certainly as the weather gets nicer and that sun beckons, uh, it's harder to make that decision. Um, I think, the, the, it depends a lot, of course, on how old your kids are, what program you're using. Um, but my general advice is that usually you don't have to finish the math book. And the best way to know is really to open up next year's math book and see what is that book assuming that your child's going to come in with and what are they going to review. Um, often that, I mean, even I as a math curriculum writer, I'm expecting that people will not do the last unit. <laughs> Honestly, I bring, I had, I've worked with a lot of real life homeschool moms, so maybe I'm more realistic than other curriculum writers, but as I write the Math with Confidence series, I hope people will do it. It really is better to get an introduction one year and then come back to something the next year than to come to that next one cold, but I know they probably won't. Um, <laughs> so, so look ahead at your next book is the best way to tell. Um, and to see what they're expecting and how much they're going to review things next year. Um, and that will help you judge whether or not you can let go of that last chunk or just hit the highlights or not do every problem or just kind of introduce some of the last ideas. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the questions I get from moms, they are almost always on the right track. That's something I've noticed over and over again is that the emails I get, Usually people are really on the right track and they just want me to confirm kind of the direction they're heading because they just don't trust themselves. Yeah. Homeschool moms are a smart bunch. <laughs> they are doing this hard work very well and very thoughtfully. And if you are doing that, like you're probably gonna make the right decision about this. Um, so I would just say to anybody who's really thinking about that, if you're really thinking about it, it's probably fine. If you're just saying, yeah, I feel like going outside, then maybe you should think about it a little bit harder. <laughs> yeah. Well, my kids, I, we do finish all of the chapters in the book, but we don't always do every problem in every chapter. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, especially depending on which curriculum they're using, there's way more problems and review of the same type of problem than, mm -hmm. than some of my children necessarily need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's and how that's we people. simplify it. That's a great way to do it. And that's something I feel keenly aware of as a curriculum writer is that like, you know, I, 
I do my best to gauge sort of what the average child is going to need in terms of review. That's something I've um, tried to really incorporate into the Math with Confidence series. There will be regular review, um, but some kids may need more and some kids may need less. And that's something that only you as their mom with your child in front of you can really gauge, but should always feel empowered to to decide. Yes. <laughs> you know your child best. You can see the child in front of you is like, oh, I totally get two digit multiplication or the child in front of you who's like two digit multiplication we did that you know um, <laughs> yeah, we, those used, are we just did that yesterday yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't <laughs> yes. both are possible for sure yeah okay well if someone's going into kindergarten obviously they should choose your curriculum textbook <laughs> of, course. of course but if you know we have lots of lots of grades so what are some questions we should be asking as we're trying to pick a good um math curriculum for next year so the main thing to think about is really how did this year go? I think that's, you know, the, I'm very big on starting with assessment, with starting with what are, the real what are the real facts in front of us? If this year worked well, you are good. Keep on going. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, but there is no harm in changing math programs. I do think sometimes people are a little too scared of that, um, that they're, like, sometimes it kind of gets, I feel like it's something that was is said at conferences or something, or they've heard that like, once you start a program, you should not change it because they have different scope and sequences and your child will just be totally messed up and- And you'll and have gaps. Do, oh, right, no. gaps, exactly. And maybe they will, you know, they're not all, you need to do it thoughtfully. You shouldn't just be like, oh, we finished grade three of this, let's try grade four of that. Like you need to look at the placement test and see if your child is, where your child fits in this new scope and sequence. Um, you should look at, you know, look at how, what worked and what didn't work about the book that you're using and use that to guide you if you're change, making a change. Like make sure you identify what's not working and not just going for, oh, well, this one looks prettier, you know, or <laughs> this one is more hands-on, you know, like really think about like, what does my child need? But again, homeschool moms are smart. They figure this stuff out. And so, you know, I think anybody who's really being thoughtful about how is this working and what's not will make a good decision. Um, but the one thing that I think we're all prone to, I am so prone to this, is being way too optimistic about what next year will be like. Um, oh, you know, the schedule will be so much more free. I'm going to have more time for this. So also be ruthlessly realistic about, you know, what you can actually implement and what fits your budget, what fits your schedule. Um, don't buy anything that is going to be too ambitious. Um, think, I always like to use the like tomorrow rule. Like if I had to start this tomorrow, would I be excited about it? Because mm. um, September is so far away. It's just enough to think that everything will be better, right? <laughs> Whatever that better is. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that is, that is, I love that tomorrow rule. I feel like that would probably be useful for a lot of decisions, not just math. <laughs> I, I think I got that from maybe Gretchen Rubin, who who writes all those books on happiness or you know it's some guru like that it's like, yeah oh, yeah the tomorrow will helpful for writing the grocery list you know mm. on thursday i will want to spend an hour and a half cooking dinner like, no i won't <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah you know with the curriculum uh, with math curriculum too i think a lot of us sometimes try to force one child like we already have the curriculum that another child used and it worked mm -hmm. well with them and we don't really want to have to go buy something else. So we're like, it'll be fine. You'll be fine with this one. And um, that was my experience with one of my children. We already had the next level and she loved math. And like she would say math was her favorite subject and just felt mm -hmm. very confident in math. Um, but instead of moving on with what she had been successful with, I was like, well, we already have this other thing. So we're going to switch to that. Mm -hmm. It was just such a bad decision because oh. Crying and she hated math and I was like this is not good she was like can we please go back to the other curriculum I was like yes <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes we can <laughs> because right. it's more, much more important to me that my children have that thought of themselves like I am a mathematician mm -hmm. like I can figure this out you know that's more important than saving a few dollars on reusing something that was great for somebody else mm -hmm. but it just didn't work for her yeah. Oh, yes. Like kids vary so much in how they approach the world, right? And kind of whether they're big picture thinkers or detail thinkers or whether they like the concepts or the nitty gritty first and um, using a, 
a program that kind of aligns with how they think is just helps so much in everybody's happiness. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't want to have crying during math lesson. That's not a good thing. I mean, no. it happens. I mean, we still cry sometimes, but every mm -hmm. once in a while crying is different than every day crying. That is such a good point. Exactly. Because uh, some days everyone's going to be grumpy. You're having a bad day or there's something that's hard, but and it's consistent tears in a subject. That's a sign that something's not working and something needs to change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming and sharing your wisdom with us today. If people want to find you online, where can they do that? So my main website is uh, kateshomeschoolmath.com. Um, and there I have curriculum reviews and information about my books and articles. Um, I also have a like an online email class that people might be interested in called Homeschool Math 101. And it's just like 10 emails that get sent to you over the course of a few weeks, but it's kind of a, a crash course in how to teach homeschool math for people who want to deepen their knowledge or have never done this before and just kind of want to get some good general ideas on how to teach it. Um, and then my books are all available at Well Trained Mind dot com or on Amazon um, and I always like to say this for moms like you with big families if you want any of my books on PDF they're all available at Well-Trained Mind uh, but not on Amazon so that's a good place to look for them if you want to be able to print lots of copies. Great thank you so much. <laughs> yes oh thank you so much for having me today I really appreciate it. Thank you very much Kate I will talk to you later I hope you guys do well in this kind of odd odd end of the school year. <laughs>